Thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, I know that South By is a very busy event, so thank you for taking the time to listen to DevOps, right? A topic that I'm really passionate about, and I really hope that you have a great time here today. <laughs> so let's introduce our panelists. Uh, Chris. My name is Chris Prouty. I'm the global leader of DevOps for Sensormatic Solutions. We're a JCI company. And we do, we're in the IoT space for retail bricks and mortar. Hi, I'm Kathy Polinsky. I'm the CTO of Stitch Fix. How many of you have heard of Stitch Fix or used Stitch Fix? OK, good bit. But there's a lot that don't have their hands raised. So uh, just briefly, uh, Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service. We're disrupting how people can find and discover clothes online. Uh, so instead of a traditional e-commerce model, you fill out a style profile, kind of like a dating profile, but about all the things that you think about when you're buying clothes. And then we have dozens of machine learning algorithms that go against that profile uh, that have an indication of what you like. We send that data to a stylist, like a human who comes and picks items uh, backed by that data. We send you a box to your house, you try it on, you keep the things that you like and pay for it, you send back the rest, we pay for shipping both ways. And we're a model that gets better and better um, over time as we get to know you. Um, we've got, uh, uh, we're a over a billion dollar business, we're a public company, um, have had fast growth, um, but a modern company uh, started uh, after the DevOps movement, um, a native cloud company, and um, we've been doing CI, CD since the very beginning. Hey everybody, Jason Warner, um, SVP of technology for GitHub. How many people know GitHub? <laughs> <laughs> How many people are using it's GitHub? Small and uh, as I guess I, we don't do, um, I won't have to go into too much into detail on that one. I've uh, been at GitHub about uh, 17 months now, and before that I uh, was at Heroku, um, and Heroku is a platform as a service, so you can kind of see the lineage that I, I come at, and what we talk about today when it comes to DevOps. Great, great. Uh, DevOps is not, new, is not new, right? Has been around for at least 10 years now, but at least from my perspective, it changed a lot, right? And now. There is a clear connection between DevOps and innovation, the ability for you to put things out there, test, get feedback, and improve over time. That's many of us, I'm including myself on this, uh, think that's the best way to succeed in the market. So let's start from the beginning. I'd like to hear from you how you are approaching DevOps in your companies and what are you getting from a business impact standpoint. OK. So. Unlike Kathy and to a certain extent Jason, my company is a manufacturing based. We create our own devices, put them out in the field. We also utilize other devices, but I've got, my team has devices that are out in the field. They've been out there for 20 years uh, reporting back in, or yeah, as long as 20 years ago. Um, and so we kind of came out of this waterfall methodology and very much manufacturing and very kind of old school. Uh, you know, technology sort of thing, and we've been kind of retrofitting DevOps onto that. And the key thing that we're getting there is we've got this great business model, we've got, you know, all these, this great list, and all the major retail customers are out there in the world, they're probably our customer, and they love what we can do for them, but they're always like, hey, we need you to do more, we need you to do faster, et cetera, et cetera. And what DevOps is doing for us is it's allowing us to do that innovation quicker, right? So everything is happening at a quicker pace, and we're figuring out what works for our customers in a speedier uh, delivery sort of methodology. Great. Um, and we're the opposite. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so as a, a cloud native company, uh, we have built our whole engineering team on practices of, of modern DevOps. Uh, we do releases constantly. So we uh, are, you know, probably have uh, had dozens of uh, deployments today already, um, probably dozens in the last hour even. And uh, this is the first company that I've worked at where I don't know when we're doing a release or a deployment. Uh, it used to be there was so much of my time that was spent planning out the next release, planning out the next um, iteration, and now it is completely uh, decentralized. All of the teams are responsible for their own deployments and they're happening every single you know, every single moment. I'm officially jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, much like Kathy, I don't actually know how many releases we did today, although I probably did a couple hundred. Um, and I think in a, GitHub's in a unique position, too, in that many companies in the world come to GitHub and ask for the transformation itself. 
whatever you're doing, we're not quite sure what that is. We need, we need help actually doing that itself. Um, and uh, quite a few of the conversations that I get in with customers is, I hear about DevOps, or I hear about continuous integration, I hear about continuous delivery. We don't actually know what that is. We don't want to know what that is. Uh, help us even understand what that looks like. So um, it's always a fun conversation, though one thing I always try to root it back in is principles. It's not about tools 90% um, of the time. It's actually about the things that you're trying to achieve. So tighter feedback loops, um, more information flow, earlier information flow. And um, I use a really bad analogy, and I'll use it here too. It's, imagine going to the dentist once every 15 years and what you're going to find in there. When you're doing a gold master release every year, every six months, as Kathy and I know, Kathy and I used to work at Salesforce together um, before we went our separate ways. And um, the time you have to spend once you, if you go to the dentist once every 15 years is amazing. Like you're going to find a whole host of problems. You want that information way, way, way sooner. You want it as, as close to real time as you can possibly get. That's actually what the principle is. Helps oh, you prevent problems too. Yes, exactly right. Great. But, but to get to the point where you can do multiple deployments per day, right, it, it requires a lot of investment. So sometimes what we see, many companies, they are very focused on features, right? So, okay, let's deliver as more features as possible, right? Because that's what's going to give us uh, this, the success that we are looking for, right? How, how to balance new features, with uh, scripting, maybe, and how to how to prove the DevOps ROI, how how to 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 prove that it's worth doing, right? Instead of building new features, maybe putting more time and energy and money, right, uh, into DevOps. Once to tackle this one. So for us, you know, I've got kind of two fronts that I tackle. On one to the business, right? Uh, yeah, you know, my business execs. You know, yes, we're a technology firm, but they are very much focused on the retail industry. So for them, you know, I'm like, okay, we're going to deliver better, faster, quicker. You know, you customers give us feedback, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're they're all for it. They're like, okay, as long as it doesn't uh, impede us getting product out or quickly or any of that sort of thing. What's interesting is it's more my internal technologists who are like, no, no, this is my area, right? So my Linux admins are like, you know, this is mine. And my engineers are like, this is mine. <laughs> And my QA folks are like, this is mine. Um, and so what we really work hard on is, you know, one, getting evangelists internally who believe in it and then spread the word. But number two is making everybody's day better, right? Making it quicker, quicker better, faster. Um, you know, Kubernetes, for example, has been a revelation for us, um, especially in our QA space. We're not as far along as we'd like to be, but everybody is now kind of like, oh, I see where we want to get to. I see the hilltop we want to take, and they're excited about taking it now. Um, so that, that velocity, that speed is starting to pick up for us. Not anywhere near these guys, yeah. but we'll get there. Sure. Um, yeah, for us, it's not a question of if we're going to invest in tooling, it's how much. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you're spot on. The two things that we look at is uh, uh, developer productivity and happiness. Um, is this serving yes. a need? Um, and then the second thing is uh, reliability. So we really value consistency. And uh, when we see a problem in production, being able to consistently address that so that another team doesn't hit the same problem. And so by developing tooling, um, you can add different checks or, or um, you know, different aspects to make sure that there's no um, manual steps along the way. I'd say in the very beginning, our tooling, um, we actually launched on Heroku and uh, grew up the first five, six years on Heroku. Um, and our tooling was a Google Doc with the instructions of Heroku tool, like uh, commands that each team uh, should run. And then we figure out what are the things that were time consuming or that were error prone, and we added scripts around that. So you can start small. I mean, it doesn't yep. have to be full-blown uh, tools. You can leverage a lot of technologies that are out there to make it simple. Um, but then as we've um, really moved to other cloud platforms, um, we build a lot of those uh, toolings uh, in internally. I, I actually feel quite lucky. I've never had to sell an executive team on transforming this way. So um, I feel lucky in that way. However, um, I, I do go uh, in <laughs> Salesforce. I do remember that, actually. You were quite successful. Um, I, I do um, have to go into organizations to talk to them about their transformation and how they might um, to gauge this. But it, it, there's a technical answer to that question. But a lot of times when you walk into organizations, too, what they're actually trying to do is be competitive in the world and competitive in the market and also attract <laughs> talent. That's where actually where there's a lot of folks are struggling these days is to attract talent to come work on their problems. And no one wants to come in and work on the old 1970s COBOL mainframes anymore. 
Um, and while that may be lucrative for a short period of time, while Fortran is still out there at the moment, that's not what most folks have grown up to use these days. And they want to use more modern tools. And so that they've got to adapt themselves just because the, the world has moved on from that way of working. And because the world's moved on, they, they can be that organization or that person or that group that kind of sticks their guns or whatever they be, but um, the world will pass them by. Great. And um, one, one thing that you mentioned, Chris, right? Uh, a lot of silos, right? So I have. Yes. <laughs> and I think one of the hardest discussion about DevOps today is it's not, ju not just about tools, right? It, tool, tooling play a big role in terms of DevOps, but it's also about process. It's also about culture. So what's your perspective on that? How to change this siloed mindset that many companies uh, have today? So, you know, my answer would be no different if you'd asked me 10 years ago about VMware or 20 years ago about, yeah, electronic trading or whatever. It's all about iterative improvements, right? So you make a little bit of improvement every day in whatever you're working on. Um, and, you know, some of that was, you know, we brought in Puppet. We started puppetizing stuff that had previously been done more or less manually. Then we brought in Terraform so that we could kind of, you know, and those were the, the tools, but at the end of the day, you know, there was a lot of discussion with my engineering staff and my QA staff in particular, like, hey, instead of kind of keeping up these monolithic systems and, you know, it's a fair amount of expense and the real expense was administrative overhead, hey, why don't you come to us and say, this, I want exactly what I've got running in production for this segment or this segment or, or whatever, and we're just going to whip it up for you at the cl click of a few buttons, et cetera, et cetera. And I will tell you, you know, that the first few times we did that, we ran into so many, like, oh, we didn't realize we manually do this config change, or we keep these sets of parameters over here, which isn't really documented super well, and these sets of parameters over there that's documented a little bit better, but we didn't know. Yeah, and it was all this, especially because some of the technology we're utilizing, some of the, the code is 20 plus years old and served us very well, created a very nice little company, et cetera, et cetera. But it, you know, again, I, I go back to you know, making everybody's day better. Mm -hmm. and, and so instead of being like, this is mine, and if you take this away from me, I won't have a job or I won't be as valued or whatnot to what makes you valuable here? It's making sure the code goes well and the customer's happy. What we're doing for you is going to allow that to happen more often. And so you are more valued in the company. Great. Uh, Kathy, Stitch Fix, right? Yes, you, I do you have a DevOps team, mm. dedicated DevOps team? How, how does it work there? Uh, so uh, we don't have any silos. Uh, we uh, hire uh, full um, engineers who are responsible for the entire life cycle. So uh, our engineers are, they do the design, the development, the quality, uh, the you know, uh, QE work, automation, DevOps, on-call support. So full end-to-end -end, um, responsibilities. Uh, and what um, I look at DevOps is a sense that we did agile transformations in like the late 90s and 2000s, and this DevOps is really that same transformation in what was tech ops or system administration or operations. And what we've really designed is we've taken out the walls um, that allows a full um, continuous learning uh, for all aspects of the pipeline. So when you have an engineer who's going to get the page, um, uh, they're going to really build things into their code, into the monitoring to make sure that they don't have the same um, thing that wakes them up at 2 o'clock in the morning again. And what I've found is like, I sleep better at night than any other job that I've ever worked. It's so rare that I get um, called because of a, you know, a disruption or an outage. Um, I have teams that are really responsible and care deeply about quality and reliability of their systems, and it really shows. I, um, GitHub is in a rather unique position in some cases uh, for cloud native companies in that we actually provide the platform upon which our own developers release and deploy to, so we have a little bit of horizontal and vertical. On top of the vertical, we have um, a lot like what Kathy described inside Stitch Fix. It looks a lot like that, and then the horizontal looks more like a cloud group in uh, AWS or Azure or Google, um, Google context. Though um, I, I always go back to incentives, and if you can align incentives inside the organization, you can get a lot of good outcomes. But um, one of the principles is, hey, you write code, you're on call. Kathy mentioned, I think I even stole your words on that one. But if you write code, you're on call, um, you're, you're going to fix some stuff. You don't, no one wants to get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you, know, you wake another group up at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> because of something that you wrote. That is a 
super strong incentive to never let that go bad again. Um, yeah. Uh, Jason, I've been following a GitHub for a while, and I know that uh, at least there is a big part of DevOps that we are calling now inner source or open source enterprise, right? So, uh, can you tell us tell us more about that? How can you promote inside your company the same practices that has been so successful for many products out there? The the success that GitHub had way back when with the open source community is that it brought the entire open source community to one platform so they could have a conversation essentially together in one spot around code. Um, that happened because they were all on the same thing. It wasn't that they were scattered across various tools or different platforms, but they were together. They could have the conversation, they could poke through each other's code, and they could see it. The same concept exists inside of organizations, but I can't tell you how many times I'll walk inside an organization and say, show me your source code. And they're like, well, let me open up these 18 browser tabs because we're using all these different tools. Mm -hmm. And I talk about a reversible or irreversible decisions or decisions that should be made at the team local versus the CTO, CIO. And there's very few decisions that need to be made at the CIO, CTO level when it comes to tools inside organizations. But I'll contend that source code is one if you want to break down silos. In some organizations, logging might be it. If you're a highly compliant organization, you need to have some, you know, logging for audit reasons or whatnot. But at the bare minimum, if you want to have your organization that's, that talks to each other, do it at the source code level. Everything else will flow from that there. So the concept of inner source is uh, largely that, uh, or enterprise open source is another way to say that, is that enterprises want the magic that happened in the open source community many years ago on, on GitHub, and they want to bring it to their organization. They said, you know, um, we've got this AI group over here, or this R&D group, or this cloud group, and we want them to know and share components or see context or that sort of thing. And again, the, the first problem is that they can't even log in to whichever source code management system that the other group is using. Fix that problem, and you can at least get to that point where you start having a conversation around the code. Great, great. Uh, what is the first step? So uh, working for, I don't know, a big company maybe, and I'd like to start working with open source enterprise, what, what, what is the first step in your opinion? Um, I ask that question, how, where is my source code? Okay. If it, is it in a bunch of these other locations and should I centralize it? Um, also, I, it, if you're not using some centralized identity system, you need to start using a centralized identity system so that anyone in your organization should be able to log into these other systems. Just to even poke around in the meantime. Um, the, the tooling around it is, I, I say this working for a, a tooling company, the tooling around it is not necessarily the most important, although I think the source code management is incredibly important. But you have to actually change some of the culture as well and some of the conversations saying, we're going to do, go this path. Here's some education tools. Here's some things to, to get yourself up to speed on it and what the value of it. Um, because you'll have people who are resistant, not for technical reasons, but for cultural or legacy or fear reasons too. Um, as Chris mentioned before, silos exist not because it's not the best uh, idea to move to a thing, but it's because they're afraid of someone moving their cheese or um, taking their money away. Essentially, their job might go away. And that's a huge uh, motivator for some people to resi be resistant. So aligning incentives. Um, outside of that, uh, tooling um, is incredibly important, obviously. And then the second, um, the, the other thing I think is show it with code or with a project or in demonstration. Uh, philosophy wins over some segment of people, more people need to see it in action. They need to touch and feel and see it. And if you can touch and feel and see something work, you can actually make it more concrete and the, the, most people will actually gravitate to that. Yeah, that, that's spot on, for sure. <laughs> PowerPoint slides don't do it. Great. Uh, of course, that's the speed is a huge component for DevOps, right? So that maybe the biggest benefit that we are looking for when we talk about DevOps. But we don't want to move faster and cause a lot of disruption, right. right? So what are your takeaways when it comes to move faster but so that's safe a, at the same time? To me, that's the greatest thing about DevOps, if done right, mm -hmm. that you get the speed and the accuracy, right? Which can, from an operational background, which I came from, is you know, kind of the, uh, the ultimate you know, goal, right? Um, so again, as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, we're, we have very much gone through all of our stuff and be like, okay, we're manual here, we're manual here, we're manual here. And it's, again, that iterative improvement, removing each and every one of those manual steps, right? And, you know, again, 20 plus year code base, it's gonna take us a while to get there properly, 
Um, but you know, we're we're starting to see it day in day out. But yeah, speed with accuracy. Yeah, and and learning from your mistakes, right? No second, don't make the same mistake twice. Right. I mean, I think that's yeah. that's critical, and I think that's what it really brings is that speed and reliability. Um, you know, we started this practice from the very early days, and our goal has just been to make sure that we can maintain it, that we can, uh, you know, we've more, more than doubled our team since I started. We've, uh, you know, <laughs> the company is so much bigger, the number of cu customers that we have, uh, the complexity of our business. You know, we started with a women's launch, now we have men's, kids, we're going international. Um, and so uh, our goal is to make sure that with the scale um, that we can maintain the speed and the reliability. And we feel like this, uh, the DevOps model is, has really helped us be able to do that. But do you think that's for everybody? Because I had some conversations with some companies, and they're like, OK, we, we don't want to move faster. We yeah. want to be slow. Well, because so this is, this <laughs> we is are Salesforce. not a startup. We yeah. are. Well, no, it's the opposite side. So um, before Stitch Fix, I was at Salesforce. We do three major releases a year. Um, and most of the Salesforce customers um, did not want us to, to release faster. So they said, don't make any more changes. We can barely keep up with the pace of three releases a year uh, because uh, Salesforce isn't um, just a software, it's a platform. People are building a lot of applications on top of it. And every single time there was a major release, they were doing their full suite of regression tests. And you multiply mm -hmm. that times 100,000s of customers, it's, it's a pretty big complexity. Um, but I was um, working um, on transforming our search infrastructure there. And we knew that we couldn't be locked into the normal release uh, cycle cadence if we wanted to be able to do a, a big architecture shift. Uh, so it was a big lift to, to be able to convince people that this is a model that we could do just as reliably, just um, as, as securely um, as the rest of the release process. Um, it started by investing in tooling. So we had to, to really show with data and metrics that we could hit the same reliability and performance metrics as um, our old system. We launched in a shadow mode. Um, and then um, uh, some of it became of, of like we were switching over between infrastructure um, behind the scenes without um, impacting um, any type of customer behavior. So it wasn't going to break any of their tests. Um, and so I would say that like even at a large company like that, they're still talking about ways that they can transform and, um, and do certain aspects of their development um, and release cycle in um, you know, a more iterative fashion. One thing that you mentioned, you mentioned metrics, right? So I'd like to hear from you all. Uh, what are the most important metrics to measure to see if the DevOps implementation is really going well? I don't know, uh, how do you measure the, the DevOps success? So a very, very wise customer, customer of mine once said, you know, measure it and then leverage it, right? So figure out, you know, just start measuring anything some days. Uh, and we've got metrics for everything. Uh, you know, for me, the, the one that I really look at is the same one I've always looked at, right? What's our uptime, right? Okay. So at the end of the day, it, you know, you want to move faster, better, et cetera, but you still, you know, you don't want to break the business. You want to keep the customers happy. Now, in terms of DevOps specific, right, so are you getting faster? Um, yeah, you know, definitely the release cycle, how many releases per day, et cetera, et cetera, like that. Um, but, but also, it's kind of funny, but sales, right? At the end of the day, like, you're delivering a product, you're trying to improve a customer's life, their business help, you know, especially for us, like, uh, the key thing is we're supporting bricks and mortar stores, which, you know, having a little bit of a problem right now. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, that said, there's some very interesting stuff going on in the bricks and mortar world, um, uh, you know, that's, that's quite fascinating, actually. And so are we helping them with their sales? And does that help our sales? That's a good perspective. Mm. Sales always good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. That's, that's, <laughs> why, that's what pays the bills, right? <laughs> Metrics are tricky because um, they can tell you the wrong things if you just keep asking the same questions. So I look at metrics that um, I think about from the context of the organization and how I would want it to improve the next cycle. So if you're measuring, uh, if you think that the organization is too slow, you're obviously going to try to look at cycle time. If you think that quality is low, you're going to look at regressions. If you think that uh, whatever, whatever you look at, um, expect to get better. So think about what you want to get better. Um, so you know, you know, when I was at Heroku, one of the things I thought is that we were releasing features too slowly. 
So I wanted to see how many per quarter we release small, medium, and large and trend it over the next couple of quarters and see how we got better. And each time I would look at those metrics, I would say, are we, are we, uh, is it a communication problem? Is it a tooling problem? Is it a release problem? And you just try to figure out from those indicators what you're looking at. Uh, so I, I, I less care about specific <laughs> metrics or would uh, talk to customers about specific metrics and talk about how you're trying to optimize. Most customers I talk to are trying to get faster, so then I talk about cycle time. Uh, great. Um, another aspect of DevOps is continuous improving, right? Continuous learning. And Google recently mentioned, uh, released a book about site reliability <coughs> engineering, and one of the topics is post-mortem, right? So are you, are you doing post-mortem in your company? Absolutely. And this is something I feel so passionate about that I think is one of the <laughs> most core tenets of DevOps. Uh, we call them blameless post-mortems. So this idea that how you create a forum anytime you have a disruption or a customer incident to get learnings from it. And you want to pull everyone involved into the same room and to talk about the issue. But the most important thing is to create psychological safety in the room. Mm -hmm. So you want people to be uh, available to share everything that happened without, being, without fearing that they're going to get fired. So if you have a culture of fear where if they get blamed for this incident and they're going to be penalized in some way, you'll never uncover the root cause of the problem. Uh, and so I think that's super important. If you really want to create a learning environment in your organization, you have to create space for them to feel safe to share. Uh, so uh, we um, talk about the five whys. So you go into the room, and it's not just like what happened, but it's really asking that underlying question, well, why did that happen? And then why did that happen? And why did that happen? And if you ask enough times, you'll really get to the root cause of what had happened. Um, so one of my teams, um, uh, you know, we had an incident, and uh, you know the incident happened because there was an operator who fat fingered the command. So you know they just made a mistake, and um, and so if you did an initial post mortem on this, you could easily say they were wrong, they made a mistake. Um, you know, end of story. <laughs> But then if you ask, well, why is it possible for someone to fat figure this command? Um, why didn't we put some safety checks in place so that if someone did make an error in typing command, why didn't we automate it? Um, you can really get into the, the underlying um, cause that you can actually do something about. Um, and when this is done right, I've seen like, I know, uh, you know, at Salesforce, we had put latest post mortem too, and then, you know, like, the engineer will be like, oh, you know, it was my fault, and I made a mistake here, and then the, you know, the QE on the team will be like, well, you know, I, um, I missed this in my testing, and then another engineer will be like, well, I missed it during my code review, and you have, like, everyone, like, jumping in, um, you know, talking about their responsibility in the issue, and it's not to blame people or to, you know, um, get you know, more uh, blame, but it's really to understand like everybody has an impact into um, an issue and everybody has a responsibility and an ability to make things better so you're not having the same mistake again. I yeah. can't uh, reinforce that enough and I think that uh, you mentioned it, you said uh, why was this even possible? Right. Why was this even possible in the first place to get to that? And it's very rare that like the fat finger one um, is a one that happens quite a bit. As a matter of fact, one of the, the biggest cloud outages ever in the history of the fat finger. Yeah. Um, the, um, it's very rare that it's a singular person or event, too. It's usually a, a, a series of cascades of, of misses across the way, too. And that's why it's, it's good to have those. You have to have those. And honestly, if, I mean, we're exactly sitting up here on the panel. We need to be learning something from these two. As, did we not put enough resource behind a certain initiative? Did we put too many features on the docket that people were trying to go too fast. Like, there's questions we need to be asking ourselves from these as well. So why was it even possible? Those are, I love that one. Yeah. Great. Let's look to the future. What excites you most about DevOps for 2019 or maybe five years from now? Oh, no, I'll leave it for oh, you. Okay. Um, so we're really excited about chaos engineering. Um, so I have a director of engineering who came from Netflix, and he was the one who coined the term there. Uh, the idea is we all run software um, teams. Uh, how many of you are going to have an outage sometime? 
<laughs> Everybody. Um, and so the idea is if you're writing software and you're shipping it, there is going to be some problem. Um, the question is you know, when and how big of an issue. And so rather than being reactive in this situation, um, uh, we create systems in place where we have game days and actually test out what happens if the service goes down, what happens if, um, if, uh, um, if there's a problem in different aspects. And the idea is that you should build resilient systems that will assume that there's going to be an outage somewhere in your instance and how can you recover gracefully or, um, uh, or still stay up in, um, if there is an issue. Uh, so we're, you know, pretty early stages of this right now, um, um, but we've had a couple of teams who have done their own little game day exercises, uh, and, um, and, and it's been great learnings for us uh, so that, um, you know, you're not getting these pages at 2 in the morning, but you're getting alerts, and you can look at them when you wake up in the, you know, during business hours and uh, figure out how you can respond. Um, we're also investing in chaos engineering this year as well. Um, uh, the way I described this to somebody recently was like, imagine you have a perfectly clean house and you just let a hundred toddlers descend on your house. <laughs> You're going to find all the ways in which it's a dangerous house for kids, but also in the ways that it can get dirty too. That's it's an incredibly great. valuable information to have, and um, I don't think you invest in it enough. Like most organizations invest in Happy Path. This is all the ways in which shit can break, and it's, I think it's an incredibly valuable investment. Um, the other thing that I'm particularly excited about is. Um, uh, everything in computing and DevOps, everything is going to be, is about abstractions. Every time you hit a new, new abstraction, you get better, get faster, um, things happen. Um, I'm excited because the, the operating systems are already a race to the bottom, and everyone knows that, but cloud is essentially a race to the bottom at this point, too. And the more hybrid you get, because you can send workloads to different clouds or different um, uh, compute instances, the easier all of our world is going to get, and that's the next phase for cloud computing. Yeah, so we, we do chaos engineering every day in production, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know exactly how my systems break. <laughs> it's good times. Uh, but <laughs> someday, someday. Uh, but to jump on uh, Jason's bandwagon, yeah, the ability to move stuff between clouds. So when we first went cloud, we went to AWS. We've now formed a partnership with Google, so we're mostly on Google. Um, however, as a global business, uh, especially dealing with various governmental and cultural things around the world, uh, we have the need as we move forward to be able to move um, amongst the various clouds, both for kind of a leverage kind of point of view to you know, decrease costs, et cetera, et cetera, or take advantage of new technologies and uh, different cloud offerings, et cetera. But also, uh, you know, China's a thing, uh, GDPR in Europe, plus some cultural stuff around there is a thing. So the ability to move that stuff around quickly, easily, reliably uh, is a big thing for us moving forward. Redundancy. Yeah, redundancy. Well, yes, of course. I, I had an old boss who joked that I bought four of everything. So that's like built into my MO. One more question about chaos engineering. Uh, when do you know that's the right time for you to invest in something like that? So wake up one day, okay, let's introduce some chaos to my, to my infrastructure here. I'd say What's it, trigger? anytime you're shipping software that could go down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, I just there there's always a, a cost benefit to all these things, and you're you know we're always making trade offs about um, uh, how much to invest in certain areas, and I think it is just a, a sense that. Um, uh, no, it's not if you invest in tooling or chaos engineering, it's like how much of your team uh, do you focus on this? And so we do an annual planning process and we cost out all of the investments that we're gonna make that is gonna drive revenue or margins uh, across the organization. But in that, we factor in a certain amount of time that we're gonna spend on on-call and DevOps and tooling. So it's, it's as the team is growing, we're investing more in tooling um, to support that growth. And it's not, it doesn't come for free. Um, and so I think as we do that, we think about, okay, what's the biggest bang for a buck that we can, we can focus on? And um, it's, you know, I could say right now, chaos engineering has gotten, you know, towards the top of that list for us to start um, um, experimenting with, but we let the teams decide. So a lot of the teams can figure out um, where the areas that they can have the biggest impact with that uh, time for, um, uh, you know, developer um, uh, tools with the idea that they're increasing reliability and not creating tech debt. Yeah, and, and the bang for buck's the key. 
right? Is what what is it saving in terms of resource time or you know just cost? Um, so you can kind of turn that around to the business and be like, okay, this is why we're doing this thing, just so you know. And I like to kind of give that top line to the various execs who are driving those sales for us. Um, and sometimes, yeah, the other times, right? So the cloud was definitely a great example of where, okay, we need to move everything to the cloud. Here's the reasons why. But there's an upfront cost to this, you know, that kind of changeover. Um, and that was a little bit of a, a tough pill to sell to the business. Now, I think they're very happy we did it um, because that definitely increased our our velocity and our pace of innovation, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's always, it's, it always comes back down to the bottom line. And, and I guess the other thing is risk. So if you have a service that going down would cost you millions of dollars, that's probably the thing that you should be focusing on the most. So <laughs> maybe that's the thing that you do a game day exercise around and really focus on how you shore that up so that that's not happening in the middle of the night, but it's happening in a controlled way that you can respond to and make sure that you don't have that incident uh, surprise you. Great. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we are now going to open for the audience to ask questions. We have a microphone here, so. So I've been, pardon me. I've been thinking about how to phrase this, um, and I'll, I'll go by way of analogy first. If you ever visit a manufacturing plant where they build like discrete items, you know, uh, vacuums, whatever, washing machines, in the plant there will be a tool room where they have lathes and stuff where they build tools. Yes. Um, and that's not what they make, but they have a tool room to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's the analogy. If you work on an, a, a team that makes internal products versus external products, there's a huge gulf when it comes to DevOps and build and monitoring and logging and all of that. Do you think that that gulf needs to get smaller, or do you think that that's a choice that, that you make to have, hey, here are these internal tools. We know that we don't use them that often. We don't build them that often. We're going to leave them like in the, in the old way of, of looking at things, like manual builds. Thank you. Good, good question. I'm not, I could take this a couple, three different directions. But you know, one, if you look at kind of internal tool building, you know, that is really what drove cloud computing, right? That's AWS. They took their internal tools and their internal, you know, they built their solution in order to handle 10 times Black Friday. And then, you know, obviously they did a bunch of stuff to that beyond that. Um, what we do internally a lot, however, is, you know, and let's say we've got a bunch of uh, subject matter experts, you know, are all fairly bright, <laughs> fairly well directed. And we let them kind of go and explore on their own. Yeah, we don't quite keep to the Google 20% time, but we try to push as much of that as possible. And do it kind of manually first, then automate it. And then it's ready to be utilized by the wider audience. But I'm, I'm not sure I quite answer your question. I think I was going to say something similar in that, um, you know, as a modern tech company, we use a lot of tools that are uh, software as a service companies out there. And so there's so many options out there that your teams can use to leverage instead of having to build it all um, in-house. And so uh, we look at this as what are the things that are you know, best in class out there that we could be using for our deployment pipeline? And then what are the things that are really unique to our situation that we want to build in-house? And it's always this uh, cost benefit trade-off that we're making. Um, but I would say more, we're leveraging more third-party tools than building in-house. Um, and that has, we've seen good dividends from that. I would, I would say the same thing when it comes to investing in internal versus external. Know what you should invest in internally versus externally is, a, is almost like an art, but most people are going to tend to want to build something internally when they should, in fact, take something off the shelf. And um, if you're going to build it internally, one, it, has, it should be as good as an external one, which is usually hard for people to uh, invest in. And uh, two, it should kind of go to your core competency. It should be something that you can leverage as a business um, or there should be some supreme need for it. Like a good, the good example is this with um, is Facebook with PHP and H HVM, I think it was way back when, which is like, how many people in the world are gonna try to take PHP and compile it down to machine native code and whatever? Well, they didn't wanna rewrite their entire site into whatever it was, so they invested in this. They made a very discreet business decision to do that. It paid off for them in some ways, and they had a huge internal engineering team to do this, but there's a cost to internal tools, yes. and you have to know that that cost is high. Um, because if you're going to do it, 
you're, if you're not doing it well, your own engineers are going to feel it. And then they're going to be grumpy. Goes, they're gonna, and uh, no one likes grumpy engineers. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for sharing your time today. Um, we're a company with only eight engineers um, currently uh, hiring for our first DevOps position. Um, we know that we want whatever it is you're describing, but have no idea what that really looks like. Um, on a good week, we deploy one release a week, and all of it flows through a single individual who has database access. So could you mm. just paint a picture of what life is like for a developer at a Stitch or a GitHub and their code and how it progresses through the, the life cycle? So day one at Stitch Fix, uh, you are pushing code out to the website. And we have a, a simple task for you to put your picture on our corporate website. Um, but the idea is that you're pulling down code, you're making an edit, you're, you're using our deployment pipeline, and you're getting used to this idea that everybody ships code. Uh, and so I'd say think about those types of things, of what's the like, smallest barrier you can get to get people used to doing uh, uh, deployments and shipping really quickly. Um, uh, I challenge of do you need a special DevOps person or do you need an, like a, a full stack engineer who has DevOps as one of the things that are good at that they can share and teach everybody else on the team on that. Um, and so that's something that, you know, when you're small, you want people who can do a lot of different things and wear a lot of different hats. Um, and so you <coughs> could have a bottleneck with that one person um, and a, a silo that you might not want to have yeah. at a small company. Um, and as you get bigger, I think that the makeup looks different. You may want specialization um, of you know, someone who is a data engineer or you know, focus on DevOps, but, um, but it is you know, something to consider as you're, as you're small. How do you not have um, the silos? I would um, echo what Kathy just said, um, that I would challenge the no notion of whether or not you need a DevOps engineer, because the ops is, I think, what you're after in that case, in this your organization. But I would, if you want to know what it feels like, sign up for GitHub, put your code in it, use Heroku, set up the CI CD pipelines from it, and then you see what happens automatically along those ways. That's, I mean, that's essentially the modern DevOps movement is from two companies, Heroku and GitHub. And you put those th two things together, you will actually feel that flow. Um, an engineer could do it today. Sure. And if you'll see what happens, um, I think you'll see the magic in it. Including the database migrations, I should add, too, which is an important aspect for this. We're, we're already on GitHub and uh, Heroku, so I'll, I'll ask why we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the right question. Hi. Um, I work at a company where a few years ago the owner read a book and the author mentioned doing 50 releases a day. So this sort of thing became a directive very quickly. At the same time, I had a directive to grow our dev team tenfold uh, on the other side of the world. So I think we achieved what I called for the first year continuous breaking. Um, <laughs> so how, what do you think are the best things to do, the most important process improvements not to turn continuous deployment into continuous breaking. Thank you. Um, I, I think the, the easiest way to break continuous deployment is to require it go through a group or a person or, an, or some entity that does not involve all the engineers and or tooling. So if you say, like, only this person can release code, that's the quickest way to, to, to break all of it down to um, the discrete components and just break it and slow it all down. So I would encourage you not to do that. Um, the other is when it comes to the continuous breakage as well is um, when you're releasing something into production, you're automatically gonna find things that you can't necessarily do in staging or local dev. And if your dev environment on your local devs machine or your staging environment that you're, you're, all your systems are gonna push into does not match at all what your production is, you're probably gonna find weird issues right away. So if you're using AWS or Azure or Google, you have your staging environments look very similar to that. Um, if you're using Docker, make sure your local devs are using Docker. Um, just try to mimic the environments as closely as possible, uh, particularly because the feedback loop is the quickest when the developer is looking at the code on their machine that day. 
I think the other thing is decomposing the code base. Yes. So if you have a monolithic data, like a monolithic code base, and everybody is is working on that same code base, it's much harder to deploy quickly, and you just have so many more tests to run against, and you're much more likely to break someone else's code. Uh, whereas Stitchfix, I think we had. Uh, 100 engineers at one point and more than 100 different applications. Uh, so each of those was really small and uh, it was much easier to make changes to it, much easier to push it out. Um, you know, it just gave you a lot more control um, over your environment. And so if you can break these up, um, you're gonna actually make it a lot easier for, for things yeah, to get done. That's a good point. Yeah, to, to Kathy's point, we have worked really hard to get stuff to a modular uh, with defined uh, you know, join points and to try to make them as uh, loosely coupled as possible. It's great on paper, in practice sometimes you run into some tricks there, especially around databases, but uh, especially with some of the older code bases, but yeah, make it as modular as possible, you know, kind of stick to that, have each thing do one thing, quote unquote, not have you know, one thing that's doing like seven different things that may or may not be related. Just to jump on that one with Kathy too, I think that the, um, the monolith to service journey is like this, this weird yeah. one where if you're a small organization with two people, it's probably better to, to be in one code base. But if you're 10,000 people, you absolutely can't be in one code base anymore. You just can't. So there's like this journey that has to happen and you need to invest in that along the way there. And um, I do encourage folks not to think of things as microservices. Like I remember walking into an organization, <laughs> I was talking to somebody and they had a color service. Well, that should be a, that should be a library. That shouldn't be a service that sits out there. But there is a journey to services, 10, 20, 30, 50, inside your organization if it's sufficiently large. That makes sense. But 10,000 services, if you're an IBM-sized company in the world, does not make a lot of sense. Thank you, guys. Hi. Um, maybe the last part was already part of the answer. But let's see. Um, you mentioned, Kathy, that um, your life got big. How, um, Got a lot, lot um, got easier since the teams um, do their own deployments, yeah? yeah, because you don't have to plan all this stuff. Yep. Yeah, absolutely understand that. Um, but we figure out that it's quite hard to keep these releases really separate, really individual, really not coupled. That big wheel. Yeah, so we are working for a big enterprise. Yeah, so <laughs> there are a lot of applications and there are dependencies in the releases. You know, we try to go to autonomous teams. We want them to have all these stuff, and we try to teach them to go there. But at the end, often there are releases which depend on each other. Are you really free of all these dependencies? Maybe question to all of you. Yeah. I mean, we've done a pretty good job of keeping different applications. So we've got applications for the warehouse, separate from the merchandising systems, mm -hmm. separate from the website um, and our mobile app. Um, but there are big projects. So we're doing um, our, uh, our UK launch um, this year. So it is, we're doing GDPR, international uh, currency, international language support. Uh, and it, it is, it's impacting pretty much every single team at the company. Um, I think the big thing that we take advantage of is feature flags. So this idea that um, you can build in um, uh, uh, features um, but put it behind a perm, a per permission flag, and if you have to coordinate things, you don't coordinate the deployments, but you coordinate when you're gonna turn on the feature. Um, and so that allows you to do more testing in an independent way. Um, it decreases the risk, because if it breaks, you can just turn it off without having to do um, a big deployment. Yeah. Um, and that um, you know, just as a, it helps with all the coordination. Okay, the feature flex cycle thing, uh, just one addition. But it's also an organizational thing. Yeah, because uh, yeah. You, <laughs> during the development, you need the teams to talk to each other. You yep. have different cycles, they have different goals, and so on. And you have to manage all this yeah, stuff. That's the harder part, actually. <laughs> so the feature, you, you're right. This, this is a, a good answer for the deployment, but the process. Yeah, yeah. Until people, you can people are much harder than tech. You know? <laughs> I'd say that um, it, you know it does take more time, um, and I think. Uh, as much as possible, if you can abstract things so that you don't have to have as much coordination, that's better if you can build it into your design. Um, but uh, we do um, a quarterly road mapping process. We based on OKRs, uh, but we do a big readout meeting every quarter that um, all the managers and any, frankly, anybody who wants to come, although I encourage the engineers to stay coding rather than attending. Um, but the idea <laughs> is that uh, it's visibility into everything that's uh, going on so that we don't have these gotchas in the middle of the quarter, like, you're working on what? 
what? And that's going to break this. Um, so you kind of do an alignment session okay. and uh, make sure that if there is a dependency on one team, that they're talking about it before they're committing to the work, um, and that you're actually having the, the good conversations about design. OK, thank you. Honestly, he actually stole my question. Ah, I, love, good I, questions. I love that question. So I'm going to ask just a bit more tweak on it. I work at a large enterprise, and we're all working toward. I think many people are working towards uh, more and more deployment. But you know, a lot of what I work with is data pipelines. Like, I depend on six different data things and two other models that depend, deal with my model, which then feeds six upstream models, and that ends up feeding three websites, kind of thing, right? And so, when you're dealing with that kind of situation, like, what advice do you have on? And, and, and to kind of his point on the organizational piece, everyone is working on this, but how do you get everyone to kind of get, is it like it's better to just say, everyone stop, let's go get this done, and then we come back to life as usual? Is it, no, no, do it iteratively, is it? I, I, my opinion on this one is that um, it, come, it comes down to people. And it's when you're doing those things, you have to imagine you're working on uh, with this group over here, you have a dependency on this group, and you have a dependency yep. on this team over here, and they roll up to different VPs. God, the political fights you can get in so quickly with those mm -hmm. things, and they're for, for all the stupid reasons that organizations get slow. Right. Um, my approach that I seem to work best is you, organizations want to reorg in those cases. Just think of the matrix teams. Think of an extended team, and think of it this way. Every day when you're doing your stand-up, who's in the room reporting on what? Um, and that's how I would encourage you to think about the, as you try to create this, this, this team construct that's loosely formed um, around uh, the project itself. And you might need a, like a program manager at some point to manage if it's a large enough organization. But I always find that the, um, the silos that get created in organizations to be kind of silly because there's no lines in this room and yet somehow we as humans are gonna find a way to divide ourselves right. <laughs> in this room across whatever barriers there are. And organizations are just the same. And I think managers' jobs and leaders' jobs are to break down all of those invisible lines and get the thing done. And you need a couple of those people that can actually just do that. Yep, got it. Yep. Yeah, so I, I agree. I, I used to joke that I don't solve technology problems, I solve people problems. Yeah. Um, because very much most of my day is spent like, okay, let's build consensus amongst yeah. folks. Um, or let's make sure our consensus, everybody sees it the same yeah. way. Now, maybe more on the technical challenge, we use a lot of message buses internally, RabbitMQ and Kafka, okay. um, and then kind of do kind of Y connectors. At the, I mean, if you think about it kind of a whiteboard type of way, um, but it depends specifically. Uh, you know, so we're moving from some fairly old database technology to some of the newer, cooler you know, stuff that's going on. So we've got a lot of those problems, and be more than happy to chat with you afterwards. Okay. Really good answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. My question is uh, more related to the testing. So as you mentioned, you have multiple deployments in a day, and it requires very solid, reliable autom test automation. And the test automation itself has its own life. So what are the efforts made by uh, in your organization to make sure that that is reliable? And uh, what is the key focus as far as the testing is concerned? So, I mean, we do test-driven development. So the idea is that when you're designing a feature, you are thinking about the automation of the tests from the very beginning. So um, you're building at your unit tests um, uh, with uh, the development. And it helps that we don't have a separate team, that that's the responsibility for each engineer to be able to do both. Um, so I think that's really important. I mean, we are now a public company, and so uh, suddenly we have financial systems that are on record for our earnings, um, and there are certain aspects of the financial reporting uh, data warehouse that need to go through a little bit more, um, uh, they require a little bit more formal um, acceptance criteria um, uh, uh, testing. And so we just think about ways that we can um, build things with uh, permissions to let data flow through, um, to test things out in a staging environment for those use cases. Um, but uh, but I'm, the other thing we didn't talk about is like I'm really excited uh, about another trend about doing more testing in production. Mm -hmm. um, so using you know, more of these feature flags and being able to roll things out to a small population, being able to roll back or turn off flags based on what you're seeing. Are you doing blue-green deployment? Uh blue-green blue deployment or 
Blue green, Can releases, black, hey, so what's your... Yeah, so we've got um, an experimentation platform um, that runs both our deployments as well as our A-B tests. Okay. And so just like we're, we're constantly doing A-B testing, um, uh, giving different uh, uh, populations different features, but we're also using that same platform to help roll out features to a small population um, and that we can uh, test and learn from and, and roll back if needed. I mean, yeah, you've got a really amazing system for this. We're doing some of this in We had moved to... Um, more of a canary build structure where we can roll it out to 5% of the fleet, 10%, and you can um, eventually automate it too. So as you see network hit it, a network traffic hit it, you can see if there's errors or needle, uh, internal system that we use to monitor these things called needles happen. You can see if you can actually roll it out to the rest of the fleet. Um, and it gives you confidence that you can actually do this. Um, the other side, of, uh, to answer your question too, to jump on what Kathy was saying too, is I do uh, think that if the engineers are the ones writing the tests and there's an incentive too to make sure the tests pass because their stuff doesn't release to production until their tests pass, there's, you, you're aligning incentives along the way. So um, over the wallness is one of the principles of DevOps that we have to push away. It doesn't go over the wall to QE team. It doesn't go over the wall to the ops team. It doesn't go over the wall to the NOC team. Um, so align the incentives of the people who are maintaining the tests. That's great. Thank you. A lot of news of late on API security, not just for monolithic mm -hmm. apps, but also for at the container, the workload, the Lambda level, and things like that. Many people looking to solve that with authorization and some really fascinating tools in that category. But this is a cultural question. I'm just curious to hear you guys enunciate, either architecturally or system-wise, how you sort of avoid the DevSec oops problem. It's <laughs> a classic. <laughs> I mean, are you asking how we secure systems? And God, that's and a trillion big, dollar. Big, secu big security into your modern architectures is really the focus of the um, end process. There's a couple of different ways in which you can think about this, but I think that you need to limit blast radiuses first and foremost if you think about this. Like, imagine you've got um, a physical data center, one physical data center that has all of your stuff in it. Imagine someone is able to physically penetrate that data center and like, like literally do whatever they want to do inside that thing. That's a really bad thing. So you're already talking about you want to like replicate across. If you have a flat network and people can get in, they can get to any system inside your network. You got to like you got to start scoping things out, and start containerizing things or, or partitioning things at a network level. These are just principles. You got to like you got to limit someone's access. If they can comp your system will get compromised. In China and Russia are out there trying to get into everyone's systems these days. Um, your system will get compromised, but you got to make it so that that one system doesn't lead to 100 percent of everything getting compromised. But we're talking about this too in terms of DevOps. So we're talking about security DevOps um, as, as the, the next theme that we're going after. And, and I think you're right. It's like, where is, there you go. Hi. Um, the, just like we were building automation and tooling um, for our deployments, how do you make sure that you're doing not just uh, your tests, but your security checks, um, you know, and not letting something ship if it doesn't pass um, specific texts, uh, the tests. And I think that if we can codify all those security controls, um, we're going to make it, all of our systems more reliable. Um, we're early days on this ourselves, but I think it is kind of a next trend. Right, it, it is a threefold thing, right? So it's the containerization or segmentization uh, at the networking layer. Uh, we relatively recently moved into Google and we spent a, that, that was what we spent our time on the first couple months before we released a single thing to Google was, okay, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do it the right way? Um, number two, you have to kind of build security in everywhere in your culture, right? Hey, everybody's gotta think about this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we do various you know, lunch and learns and symposiums and all that stuff. Um, and, and that's pretty valuable. And then number three is kind of limiting your external footprint or surface area to, uh, to the rest of the world. So in one way, we're an IoT firm, and so we've got all sorts of issues with that, right? We've got a lot of concerns around our devices in the field. Thankfully, many of them are so old that you know, they're uh, not using modern technology and people can't get into them. One, one comment I want to make is that uh, back when I was starting out, um, development way back when, they had this concept of um, an ARB, an architectural review board. Mm. And you, the architectural review board meant af, met after something was completed. And they're like, well, we don't like this architecture. That's kind of a complete <laughs> wrong time to have an architecture discussion. The thing's already done. You already spent money, time, energy, and effort to do that. Security is similar. Like a lot of places have security reviews at the end right before it's supposed to go to production. You want these conversations to happen before the feature gets written with the engineers and the product managers or whoever so that you can have these, these notions up front. Um, security is actually the one where I think there's a, a quite a bit of specialty in it too. There's a, 
So I do yeah. think that you can um, have a security. Uh, our, our one specialty engineer, yeah, set yeah, of engineers, is our like security they're, engineers. That's a very <laughs> specialized yeah. group, and I think that you can um, have them embedded on teams as well to be the security person. So if you say, I don't really have any idea what's about to happen to me here when I release this, can you help me sort this out before I, I build it? So thank you very much. Thank you. Do we still have time for one more question? One. Okay, okay. Um, I'll make it quick. And thank you all for your time today. Uh, I work at a firm that invests in early stage software companies, many of which are themselves DevOps tools. Um, they're all still kind of trying to create religion around DevOps best practices around the time we come in. Jason, I think you mentioned uh, you all y'all aren't really uh, metrics driven in the way that you evaluate performance within your DevOps teams or something to that effect. But are there a few headline metrics that I could ask a DevOps leader to try to get an understanding of like how hygienic, so to speak, the 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 DevOps team is, or maybe whether or not they're you know. So to be clear, yeah. I wasn't not metrics not driven. It's more of a, I focus on what I wanted the organization to improve upon at that time. So in our case, like some of this stuff is um, already, we're already good at, so we don't need to focus on that, but we want to focus on the other things. Um, I like to start with the customers. How, what's the customer going to experience? So I think Chris mentioned uptime. I, yeah, uptime I track uptime all, yeah. this, all the time. I talk about um, how fast we are, because I think that's a good signal for other things. If we're releasing things pretty quickly with low regressions, that is a good signal that we're actually developing things on a, um, in a healthy way. Um, but from a DevOps perspective, I don't look at too many of those things. I think that's just part of, uh, you know, I, I had the luxury of working in many modern software companies for the last 10, 10 years. I don't think it's necessarily in our nature to have to optimize this side of the curve. We have to optimize this side of the curve. Yeah, that's probably a good uptime, uh, velocity, and regressions. It's probably that's going to give you a real good idea. But now I'm not sure if you're asking for internally or for the products these folks are selling. In internally. Okay. Yeah. yeah then I I would go with uptime, velocity, and regressions. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.